is common for these large hotels to be organized around a particular theme, such as the Middle Ages, the Arabian Nights, the movies, the circus, Paris, Egypt, or the Far East. The hotel, its restaurants, shops, lounges, and entertainment reflect this theme. For example, the Paris Las Vegas Hotel has a 50-story replica of the Eiffel Tower. The Luxor Hotel has a huge image of an Egyptian sphinx and a replica of the tomb of King Tut. Nearly all of the major hotels also contain a casino, sometimes several casinos. Gambling is a major reason why people come to Las Vegas. There are slot machines, blackjack tables, and roulette wheels, and much more. Even though Las Vegas is in the desert, there is an extravagant use of water. Large swimming pools, water slides, artificial waterfalls, and huge fountains are common. Health spas, beauty salons, fashion boutiques, specialty restaurants, and malls abound. Tennis and golf are also popular. The lavish shows at Las Vegas are world famous. Tall dancing showgirls, like the famous Rockettes, wear beautiful but rather skimpy costumes. Some entertainers, like singer Wayne Newton, rarely leave Las Vegas. The pay there is good, and the audiences are appreciative. Near Las Vegas are other tourist sites, such as the giant Hoover Dam. Behind the Hoover Dam is the large artificial lake, Lake Mead. Further up the river is the Grand Canyon. All these things are a short trip from the city. Las Vegas is called the city that never sleeps. At nearly any time of the day or night, there are casinos and shows that are open. A monorail connects many of the leading hotels. Many people view Las Vegas as a total entertainment package. One word of caution: set yourself a limit on how much you will spend at the casinos. Gambling can be addictive. Laura Secord. Women have often played an important role in war. They have worked in munitions factories, made clothing and supplies, encouraged and entertained soldiers, nursed the wounded, and acted as spies. It is rare, however, for a woman to have played a key role in determining the course of a war. Many people believe that Laura Secord played such a role in the War of 1812. Laura Secord was born in the United States at the time of the American Revolution. Her father had fought in the U.S. Army against the British, but when land in the American states became scarce, the family moved to Ontario, Canada, and so back under British rule. Laura married into a pro-British family and adopted their political views. So when the War of 1812 broke out between Britain and America, her husband. Husband, James Secord joined the Canadian militia to defend Ontario against the Americans. The American invasion of 1812 was defeated at Queenston Heights, and some of the wounded were brought to Laura's house in nearby Queenston. Laura went out to the battlefield where she found her husband James, who was severely wounded, and brought him home. In 1813, the U.S. invasion was more successful. Parts of Ontario close to the U.S. border were occupied by American troops. Local families were expected to provide room and board for U.S. officers. It was sometimes possible, therefore, for Canadians to overhear American officers discussing military strategy, either in their homes or in the local tavern. The situation in Ontario looked desperate. In the spring of 1813. The whole province seemed likely to fall into American hands. In June, Laura overheard talk of an American attack on the British outpost at Beaver Dams. Her husband was still suffering from war injuries, and she had to look after him and their children. Nevertheless, she resolved to go to warn the British commander. Possibly, Laura did not intend to walk the whole way herself. She hoped to be able to pass on the news to someone else along the way. First, she would have to make up a story to get past the American sentries. She left Queenston in early morning and walked 19 miles to the neighborhood of Beaver Dams by nightfall. She still had to cross a wide stream and climb up the Niagara Escarpment. There, she came upon an encampment of Indians who were assisting the British. Their war cries in the moonlight terrified her, but she insisted on being taken to the British commander. Finally, one of the chiefs. Escorted her to British headquarters, and she was able to tell Fitzgibbon the American plan of attack. When the Americans arrived in the neighborhood of Beaver Dams, the Indians had prepared an ambush for them. A running fight ensued between the American force of 570 soldiers and 450 Indians supporting the British. At this point, Fitzgibbon arrived with 50 British regulars. Seeing the Americans disorganized and surrounded by the Indians, Fitzgibbon boldly demanded their surrender. 
by telling the American commander Boatsler that he was facing huge British and Indian forces, Fitzgibbon induced the American leader to turn over his whole army to the British. Although only small armies were involved at Beaver Dams, the battle had great significance. Afterwards, the Americans stayed behind their walls for the rest of the year. The U.S. government recalled their commander in chief. British and Canadian morale increased, and Laura's home in Queenston was restored to British control. Laura Secord's story was little known until 1860. She was an old woman in her 80s when she was presented to the visiting Prince of Wales, later. King Edward the Seventh. He awarded a gift of money for her services. Her story then became famous. Today, her home in Queenston, Ontario, is an historical museum and a popular tourist attraction. Little House on the Prairie. Much of the history of North America is about how Europeans moved westward from the Atlantic coast towards the Pacific. The first settlements began around 1600, and it was a long time before the Europeans settled the interior. By the late 18th century, however, good farmland along the east coast was becoming scarce. As the population increased, people began thinking about all the native Indian lands further inland. Families were quite large in pioneer days, and the oldest son usually inherited the family farm. This meant that other sons and daughters would have to move away when their parents died. Often, the sons would want to begin their own farm and start their own family. But if there was no farmland available, or if it was too expensive to buy, they were out of luck. One option was to move west, where land was free or very cheap. Sometimes the whole family might move if their old farm was no longer productive. Sometimes the old farm was on poor soil, or too much farming had exhausted the soil. Perhaps better land could be had further west. There were other reasons for moving west. Pioneer settlers depended on wild birds, fish, and wild animals for food, furs, and skins for clothing and trading, and trees for building materials. These things had become scarce in old settled areas. Out west, there were lots of animals to hunt for food, and animal skins could be traded for supplies. It seemed that it was easier to make a living on the frontier. Of course, there were some problems regarding moving west. Various American Indian tribes who might fight to defend their land occupied the land. Then the land needed to be cleared of trees and stumps before it could be planted. A log cabin and other buildings had to be built. A well had to be dug, or a spring of water found. Settlers might also suffer because there were no doctors or teachers or stores available. These things, though, often did follow closely behind the first settlers. A series of Little House books, written by Laura Ingalls Wilder, tells the story of her pioneer family. The Ingalls family moved many times while Laura was a little girl. She was born in Wisconsin in 1867. Her family moved next year to Missouri. Then they moved to Kansas in 1869. The Ingalls moved back to Wisconsin in 1871. They moved to Minnesota in 1874. Her family went to Iowa in 1876, then back to Minnesota in 1877. Finally, they moved to Dismit, South Dakota, in 1879, and there the family remained. All these moves were typical for a pioneer family, always on the lookout for better land and other opportunities. But all these moves involved very hard work, all of which seemed all lost when the family had to move again. For example, when Laura's parents moved to the Kansas Prairie in 1869, they had many hardships. The family put all their belongings in a covered wagon, which measured four feet by ten feet. Two horses pulled it, and the family dog followed along. Laura and her sister Mary were very little girls. The family and their wagon were nearly washed away trying to cross a small river. They traveled through wild, tall grass where there were no roads. Laura's Father built a house on the open prairie with logs he had hauled from the creek bottoms. One of the nearby settlers helped him. They also built a log stable for the horses. That was a good thing because the next night their little house was surrounded by a pack of fifty large wolves. They formed a large circle around the house and howled all night.
One day, while Laura's father was away, two Indians visited the house. They wanted Laura's mother to feed them and stood silent while the food was cooking. The Indians wore only fresh skunk skins as clothing. After the Indians had eaten all the food, they left. The following spring, there was a large gathering of Indian tribes. Most of them wanted to fight the settlers. For many nights, the sounds of Indian drums frightened the settlers. One tribe opposed the plan, and finally the gathering broke up, and the Indians went away. Many other problems faced the Ingalls family. These included bad weather, prairie grass fires, and malaria. The worst part was having to leave their new homes. The government decided that Laura's family was living on Indian land and would have to move. So the covered wagon was packed again, and the family traveled north. Such experiences were not unusual for pioneers in the 19th century. Mutiny. Mutiny is a word that has brought fear to the most powerful empires in the world. Mutiny is when soldiers and sailors refuse to obey their commanders, often killing or imprisoning them. Mutiny can spread through whole armies and navies, throwing governments into crisis. No wonder that nations have always taken harsh measures to punish mutinous leaders. The ancient Romans executed every tenth man from an army unit that had mutinied. In the British Navy, mutineers were normally hanged. However, one of history's most famous mutinies did not happen to a whole army or navy. It happened on a single small ship, the HMS Bounty. HMS Bounty set sail from England in December 1787. It was a small, cramped vessel, uncomfortable during a long voyage. Its goal was to sail to the South Pacific and bring back Tahitian breadfruit plants. The government hoped that breadfruit would provide a cheap food for black slaves in the British West Indies. The captain of the bounty was William Bly, a veteran of many voyages. His crew, however, was largely made up of inexperienced young men. There was no room on the ship for soldiers or marines, so Bly, as the only commissioned officer, had the difficult task of maintaining order. After a long and difficult trip, the bounty finally arrived in Tahiti in October 1788. Free from the constraints of life aboard ship, the young men enjoyed life on the tropical island with the friendly natives. Many of the sailors established relationships with island women. Meanwhile, the collection of breadfruit plants for the homeward voyage continued. In April 1789, Captain Bly decided that it was time to return to England. The breadfruit plants were loaded on the deck, making the ship cramped indeed. The bounty set sail and would no doubt have reached England again, except for the turmoil in the mind of one of its young officers. Fletcher Christian was 24 years old, of dark complexion and from a good family. As the bounty pulled further from Tahiti, Fletcher seemed to have decided that he didn't want to return to England. Tahiti had been an earthly paradise, and now long months of discomfort aboard ship awaited him. He was too far from Tahiti to return by himself. He would need the bounty. On April 28, 1789, some of Fletcher Christian's friends seized control of the ship. Captain Bly and 18 sailors who supported him were put in a small open boat with limited food and water. Meanwhile, Christian and his 24 followers sailed back to Tahiti. Eventually, Fletcher Christian would sail the bounty to the uninhabited Pitcairn Islands, far to the south of the shipping lanes. Meanwhile, Bly and his loyal followers sailed in their open boat almost the width of the Pacific Ocean. They suffered from thirst, hunger, and sickness, as well as hostile natives. Finally, they reached Timor in Indonesia in June and eventually made their way to the capital, Batavia. When they returned to England, Captain Bly was first greeted as a hero. Soon, however, public attitudes changed. The legend began that Bly was a cruel tyrant who had caused the mutiny by harsh treatment of his men. Although Bly had a temper and was not very tactful, this does not appear to be the whole story. In fact, it is the controversy over who is to blame for the mutiny, Bly or Christian, that has kept the story alive for more than 200 years. North America's Rainforest When people think of rainforests, they usually think of the tropical jungle, but heavy rain can also produce dense forests in temperate areas. Along the northwest coast of North America, there are some of the largest trees in the world. This forest runs along the Pacific coast from Alaska down to northern California. About half of it is in British Columbia, Canada. 
Several species of trees grow to an immense size. Some grow up to 95 meters, 312 feet high, and 12 meters, 40 feet in circumference. They may be as much as 1,000 years old. Because the trees are so tall, the forest has various levels of growth. Small plants attach themselves to the tall trees and may form a kind of garden in the air.